We're broadcasting live from the United Nations Climate Summit in Baku, Azerbaijan, which has entered its second and final week. Despite the pledge from countries around the world at last year's COP28 in Dubai, the burning of coal, oil and gas continued to rise this year. 2024 is also set to follow 2023 as the hottest year on record, this according to the World Meteorological Organization. This year's climate summit comes amidst high uncertainty for the future of climate negotiations, as U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has promised to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement again. Despite strict regulations, protests have been taking place here at the COP as climate activists from around the world try to get their voices heard. In fact, a number of journalists and climate activists in Azerbaijan have been arrested in the last year in the lead up to COP. We'll be talking about that later in the broadcast with Human Rights Watch. But first, on Saturday, Democracy Now! was here when hundreds of climate justice activists from around the world occupied a plenary room to protest the lack of progress on climate negotiations and then came out for a silent protest in the corridor where Democracy Now! caught up with them. Hi, my name is Sydney Males Muenala. I'm from Ecuador. I am an indigenous woman from the community Quichua Otavalo. So we are here because we need to reclaim all of the violation of the human rights, especially from the indigenous people. So we are here like young people, young indigenous women, because we need to defend our territories and demand the mining, the, the climate crisis, because you have that transnationally in our territory, and this is like the violence for our bodies, our community, our territory, our water. My name is Juliana Esprilla, I'm from Colombia, and I'm an Afro-descendant woman, and I'm here because I am trying to enhance my voice to talk about our people, our communities, and why, why climate change is needed to be treated urgently. We need the money, we need it now. My name is Karina Lester, I'm from Australia, and I'm a second generation survivor of British nuclear tests that happened in Australia in 1953, but the program continued through the 60s as well. So I've come here to be part of this event to just send a strong message around nuclear and the impacts it's having on Indigenous peoples in Australia and also around the globe as well. So here to you know voice our concerns because our government's also thinking of nuclear power plants as well. So we're very concerned about that as Indigenous peoples because it'll impact on First Nations peoples in Australia. Australia. Would you share some of the impact it had? Yeah, many people had passed, but many people have quite sick illnesses as well from the British nuclear testing program that happened in the 50s and 60s. My father was blinded by those British nuclear tests that happened on the 15th of October 1953, and so it took something away from him. And we as the next generation live with this and carried that tragic story of what happened to his people, how his people were harmed by the fallout, and how people still continue continue to suffer today with autoimmune diseases, with chest infections, with skin rashes on their skin. There's many other like infant mortality concerns within our communities as well and we're very remote in Australia and those locations were very remote and so we're quite concerned about our people but also our environment because our country wears the scars of those British nuclear tests today. Chabo Sibego from uh, Earth Life Africa in South Africa. So we are here for a, a protest. Number one is to raise awareness to the whole global society that uh, more f uh, fossil fuel must be kicked out of Africa. Uh, more finance should be allocated for sustainable projects. Uh, finance must actually be allocated to all the African regions that has been, um, their environment has been destroyed as a result of fossil fuel extra, ex 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 extractivist projects. We are protesting here because we have discovered that there's more uh, fossil fuel lobbyists attending the COP29, which means the voices of the voiceless will still be suppressed. 
So, and uh, therefore, we felt that it is, it is proper for us to combine and join forces to protest, you know, to do a silent, proste- a, a silent protest and also a peaceful protest to raise our awareness, to amplify our voices. My name is Nadia Haddad, I'm from the European Disability Forum and the purpose of us being here is to reclaim the rights of persons with disabilities because mostly we have 1.9 billion of persons with disabilities around the world and the majority of them is living in the south. That's been one uh, on every six persons has a disability and yet we are not recognized. We are not part of the consistency of persons with disabilities, we are not there under when they're uh, taking decisions. So we are those who are really left behind between the most vulnerable worlds, while we are the most impacted. For example, whenever there is a uh, an disaster, first people are the world, are they, the first people are only starting with information. The information given is not acceptable. For example, deaf people, people are blind, people are deaf blind, people with intellectual disability. So they even don't get the information, there's an alarm, they don't hear it. When there is, they are, there is something, uh, an like emission, a special, uh, a special request, people who doesn't understand easily, or people with social psycho problems, do not know where it is, so there is still no, so we are reclaiming, for example, a fast tracking mechanism, so they could detect them very fast. When there is rescue, for example, there were flutes in Germany, we are not speaking about the South, there were flutes in Germany. Those who stayed behind, were all, were all of them are wheelchair users, 10 of them just kept drunk in the water because when the firemen arrived to rescue them, they didn't have adequate materials to rescue them. So whenever something happens, persons with disability are always those the most affected. They can't run away, they can't understand, they can't hear, and they are not considered be rescued first because priority takes too much time. So there is a kind of triage, even in disasters. And that's why we are here. We want equality, we want them beforehand to prepare, and if something happens, then to be sure that if we're going to build better, build back better, then it should be accessible and affordable for all of us. I'm Carolina Santos, I'm from Brazil. I'm an activist, I'm climate and um, environmental uh, social activist in Brazil. Brazil's hosting the next COP. Yes, in my city, Belém. So we're kind of doing some preparations for that here. The main thing this year is uh, climate financing. So we find it really important that especially people from the countries of the global south are present and have a voice. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to say anything uh, by the, the, you know, the, the regulations and stuff. But we are trying to make noise as well as we can, uh, trying to get our message across as, as well as we can. So we're here to demand uh, justice for, for the Global South. We're here to de- demand climate financing for adaptation and mitigation for the, climate, for the, for the, for the Global South, uh, especially the countries that have suffered the most with massive climate events. My name is Akram, um, and I'm here uh, with the Palestinian delegation. And uh, one of the issues that we're discussing is a uh, global energy embargo. So there was an action demonstration here in this quite large hall in uh, Baku. Uh, I think we're actually under a, a football stadium. Uh, the action was a cross-constituency action to raise awareness about the anger that many people feel at the fact that these uh, COP negotiations are increasingly disconnected from reality. And the issue that we were raising alongside many others was this question of the fueling of genocide. The same fossil fuel companies that profit from the destruction of the environment are also profiting from the genocide being committed against the people of Palestine, particularly the people in Gaza. Uh, For example, the jet fuel used in US aircraft is shipped from the United States. Other uh, fuel is shipped from here, from Azerbaijan, through the BTC pipeline, through uh, Turkey, and then shipped to Israel. Uh, All of this is part and parcel of the Israeli war machine, 
and we've now had a year of seeing the most horrifying scenes on our television screens. No one in the world is, under, is in any doubt that what we're witnessing is a genocide. It took very many months for world leaders to say that they were willing to accept a ceasefire. And now this language of calling for a ceasefire has become totally and utterly meaningless. What we want is not empty words, it's action. And we particularly expect that from the nations in the world that claim to support the people of Palestine. Uh, amongst the foremost uh, groups, uh, for, amongst the foremost nations sending energy to Israel are South Africa, who initiated the ICJ case, Turkey, which uh, speaks regularly uh, for the people of Palestine and yet pro allows 50% of um, Israel's oil to flow through its territory, and Brazil, where 9% of Israel's oil comes from. What we're saying is that we need to follow the example of Colombia, who took the decision in August to stop selling coal to Israel, because the Genocide Convention obliges them not to sell any weapons or dual-use products, products that can be used in the conduct of war, which will aid and abet the um, commit committing of a genocide. Colombia took that decision relatively quickly, relatively straightforwardly, and there's no reason why other nations cannot make that same decision. Uh, it's not enough to pretend to support the people of Palestine, to make grand claims. Now, a year on into this genocide, people are judged by their actions, not their words. And any of these countries could take and follow the example of Colombia in imposing an a energy embargo, and that would, would have an enormous impact directly on uh, the ability of uh, 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 Israel to conduct the genocide, but uh, long term um, on its ability to continue its settler colonial expansionist project. Voices of protesters Saturday here at the United Nations Climate Summit in Baku, Azerbaijan. Special thanks to Democracy Now!'s Renee Feltz and Tamari Astudio.